let's uh, first invite uh, Professor Sumit Ganguly uh, for our network. Uh, and let's start with a thank you note to him. He's in the US, it's early morning for him. Uh, he's kindly agreed to address uh, the 10 institutions uh, here. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, for, not at all. Uh, for for having <laughs> to eat. I, I know it's not an easy task, you know, in the, in the morning. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Priya Suresh. Uh, she teaches at uh, the Stella Mari uh, College at Chennai in the Department of International Studies to formally introduce our network to you and also introduce you to our uh, team. Uh, Priya, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Subha. Uh, good evening and good morning. <laughs> On behalf of uh, all the uh, of the 10 network institutions in the uh, southern part of India, I think this is the first of its kind. And uh, we would like to place on record our sincere thanks to Dr. Subha for you know, taking this initiative. We've been organizing several programs. I think it's almost uh, two, three years that we've been organizing several programs. And, uh, and uh, on behalf of these 10 uh, network institutions in the southern part of India, uh, and Niyas, we profoundly thank our distinguished speaker, Professor Ganguly, distinguished professor of political science at Indiana University and Rabindranath Tagore Chair in Indian Culture and Civilization at Indiana University, Bloomington, for accepting our invitation to deliver the lecture on a very, very important and critical topic, U.S. and the World Order, Options and Challenges in the 20, 2020s. It is indeed a pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening, Professor Sumit Ganguly. I'm sure all of us present here uh, uh, are really honored and thankful uh, to Professor Ganguly for having accepted our invitation and, uh, and a person of great repute and scholar uh, who needs no introduction, but, uh, but it is appropriate that we formally introduce him. Uh, Professor Ganguly is a specialist on the contemporary politics of South Asia. He is the author and co-author, editor, or co-editor of 20 books on the region. Professor Sumit Ganguly taught at James Madison College of Michigan State University, Hunter College, and the Graduate Center of the U City University of New York, and the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Ganguly is a recipient of several fellowships and awards, to name a few, visiting fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at the Center on Democracy, Development and Rule of Law at Stanford University, spent the summer of 2018 as an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the University of Heidelberg. Professor Ganguly was the NG and Chair in International Politics at the Rajaratnam School for International Studies at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, visiting professor at the Strategic Studies Institute of U.S. Army War College 2017-18 serves on the editorial board of the American Political Science Review, Asian Affairs, Asian Security, Asian Survey, Current History, Journal of Democracy, Non-Proliferation Review, Pacific Affairs, International Security and Security Studies. Professor Ganguly's books include uh, uh, the Oxford Handbooks of India's National Security, OUP 2018. He's currently at work on a book that focuses on the region and evolution of India's defense policy for Columbia University. I think we are extremely honored and privileged to have you with us this uh, evening from our side and as early as uh, the US time. Thank you so much uh, uh, once again for having accepted our invitation. And I think all of us are looking forward to listening to your very, very interesting lecture. And I'm sure there's gonna be much more in the Q&A session. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And we do look forward to listening to your lecture. Thank you. Uh, Professor, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Subha. I am deeply grateful to Dr. Subha Chandran, whom I have known for many years um, um, from earlier incarnations in New Delhi. Uh, and so it is a delight uh, to do this. And actually, I don't know why uh, my hosts are being uh, overly kind and saying that I had to get up at some ungodly hour. That's really not true. It's 8.30 in the morning and uh, you know one is normally uh, up and awake, uh, perhaps not dressed uh, to speak to an audience, but certainly awake uh, uh, by this hour. Uh, so it's not really an imposition at all. And in fact, a pleasure and a delight uh, to address 
uh, this audience. The talk is uh, focused on the US and world order um, options and challenges. And um, basically the talk is divided into three distinct segments. First, I'll talk about Trump's legacy. Then I will talk about the world that uh, Biden confronts. And finally, I will talk about the strategies that Biden has undertaken to deal with the world that he confronts and um, uh, how best to cope with the world that he is faced with. First of all, a couple of quick words about the Trump legacy. Um, uh, this will come as no surprise to any of you because you study international politics and presumably American foreign policy. There were two features that I think characterized Trump's uh, term in office. First, um, uh, especially as far as American foreign policy was concerned. First, a focus on unilateralism and an, and an America first policy. Essentially a policy where the US went alone and it did pretty much what it wanted without any regard for the sentiments of friends or allies. Uh, unilateralism was the hallmark of Trump's foreign policy and the rest of the world could be damned as far as he was concerned. As long as he thought it suited American interests, he was going to follow uh, his instincts. And basically it was instincts. It, and because there was, and the second point is that it was marked by policy incoherence. You rarely knew from one week to the next what would motivate the president. After referring to Kim Jong-un as little rocket man, then he claimed that he fell in love with Kim Jong-un because Kim Jong-un had written such beautiful letters. This is complete policy incoherence. There, there was no method to the madness other than his emphasis on America first. So in my judgment, I would argue that Trump did untold damage to American foreign policy interests throughout the world, alienated longstanding allies and pursued a set of policies that really lacked any sense of intellectual coherence. So Biden inherits a rather unfortunate legacy uh, uh, given uh, the uh, policies uh, that Trump had pursued. And perhaps Trump's greatest error was his attempt to ingratiate himself to Vladimir Putin, um, who at least from the standpoint of the United States, had interests which were completely at odds with the interests of the United States. But for some inexplicable reason, and of course there are any number of theories that seek to explain why Trump was so um, uh, uh, ingratiating uh, towards uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, those theories aside, there is no question about it that he sought to accommodate Putin uh, on a range of issues, even when Putin acted in ways that were quite inimical to American foreign policy and American security policy interests. Biden then inherits this policy incoherence, this legacy of unilateralism and Trump's attempts to placate uh, Putin on a number of issues. And there are four specific items that I will mention in terms of the world that Biden has inherited. The one area where I would argue that there is an element of policy continuity, even though it's being pursued in a markedly different fashion than under Trump, because under Trump, it it involved name calling, it involved um, uh, harsh <coughs> sanctions, it involved uh, 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 trade uh, uh, sanctions. And this involves basically <clears throat> the US relationship with the People's Republic of China. While Biden has continued 
many of the Trump policies, he has not resorted to the same sort of ugly and uh, uh, pointless and meaningless rhetoric when it comes to dealing with China. He recognizes that China is a potential peer competitor of the United States and is pursuing policies, especially in the Indo-Pacific, which uh, are at odds with the policies of the United States. But he has dropped the ugliness and the undiplomatic language that had characterized the Trump administration. But Biden clearly sees China and Russia as the principal great power competitors to the United States. He's quite clear about this and American strategy is now geared essentially to compete with China and Russia. And he sees that, that these two great powers are the two principal competitors to the United States and offering a vastly different vision of world order than the one that the US wishes to pursue under Biden. Second, as is well known, there is an attempt on Biden's part to reduce US expeditionary commitments and to end what he refers to as endless wars. One can certainly criticize the manner in which the US withdrew from the United States, but basically, uh, sorry, with the US withdrew from Afghanistan, but basically I support the withdrawal from Afghanistan. After an expenditure of $2.1 trillion, after the debts, of 243,000 people, including vast numbers of civilians, the loss of close to 2,500 American servicemen, the expenditure of $83 billion on the uh, Afghan armed forces themselves. There was no prospect of a different outcome unless the US was prepared to spend the next 30 years there. And quite frankly, in terms of domestic politics, the support across the board just wasn't there. So there's a bit of Republican carping for partisan political purposes about the hastiness of the withdrawal and how clumsy the withdrawal was. But quite frankly, the die had already been cast under Trump, who had negotiated a terrible deal with the Taliban. A, uh, the Doha agreement that Trump had reached was one of the worst imaginable agreements. And to large degree, Biden's hands were tied. One can certainly raise questions about the haste of the withdrawal and uh, the uh, failure of certain logistical uh, arrangements, and we can talk about that during the Q&A. But basically, um, I think it was a sound policy decision to bring this pointless war to a close. It demonstrated the difficulties of a counterinsurgency strategy to be carried out at such great distance. The last time the US had been successful in pursuing such a counterinsurgency strategy was against the Hakbalaha rebellion in the 1940s and early 50s in the Philippines. Since then, the record of US counterinsurgency abroad, quite frankly, speaking has been abysmal and I've written about this and would be happy to explain why the Hakbalahap uh, episode was so successful in the Philippines and Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan have been abject failures. Third, despite the fracas surrounding the AUK-US decision, I think this was an attempt on the part of the Biden administration to restore a degree of comedy with key allies, ranging from Britain to Australia. Yes, the French are upset and the French have some grounds to be upset, but by the same token, when it has suited the French, they have sold weaponry to any number of countries defying the United States. So there is a bit of hypocrisy on the part of Paris about, uh, and, uh, 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 and so while Paris could have been consulted, perhaps 
that Paris should not have been undercut in the manner that it was, but let's be also honest about it. When it has suited Paris's interests, they have sold weaponry to all manner of countries, including some fairly unsavory regimes in this world, um, defying the NATO and the United States. So it's not as if uh, the US was unique in making such a unilateral move. But at any event, there is a concerted attempt on the part of the Biden administration to restore a degree of civility, trust and comity with its principal allies, especially the members of NATO. Uh, and I don't buy the argument because there is contrary evidence to suggest that NATO indeed had been informed about the imminence of the American withdrawal from Afghanistan. So the notion that NATO was kept completely in the dark does not completely, does not stand up to scrutiny. Perhaps the Biden administration could have been more fulsome in informing NATO, uh, the NATO allies, but the notion that the NATO allies were completely blindsided is simply untrue. Finally, I would argue that under this administration, we witness a return to multilateralism. The US has returned to the Paris Accord. Biden, if belatedly, has taken a major role in vaccine diplomacy. The announcements last week at the United Nations reveal the seriousness with which he's taking this pandemic and US obligations to the rest of the world, the commitments of vast numbers of vaccines um, to be made available to poorer countries, clearly demonstrates again a commitment to, um, uh, uh, to multilateralism. Third, Despite very fitful progress on the subject, the U.S. is returning to the uh, uh, Iran nuclear accord, despite the attempts of the right wing government in Israel to scuttle this effort. Um, uh, and quite frankly, the Biden administration should ignore these uh, Israeli blandishments for the simple reason that our interests don't always align with that of Israel. Israel may well be a staunch ally and worthy of American protection thereby, but that does not mean Israel gets to uh, exert a unit veto on American foreign policy. It's in our interest to curb the uh, Iranian nuclear weapons program uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And Israel does not get to dictate American foreign policy. That's simply not about to happen. And the Biden administration should not in any way back off from its efforts to bring Iran back into the comity of nations and to try and resurrect the joint comprehensive program of action, regardless of what Naftali Bennett happens to think or speak out against. Um, his interests don't necessarily dovetail with those of the United States. Finally, I will talk a little more explicitly about the strategies that this administration has undertaken in terms of building a world order. Number one, as the competition with China and Russia demonstrate, there is an emphasis on challenging authoritarian states, which are offering an alternative model to the United States, ranging from the 2008 financial crisis all the way to Trump's com near complete mangling of the COVID crisis, and also the policy incoherence initially in the wake of COVID in much of of the advanced industrial uh, democracies has led China and along with that Vladimir Putin, um, uh, Xi Jinping and then Vladimir Putin to suggest that perhaps authoritarian states with their particular model uh, of development can offer a better alternative to liberal capitalism. 
And consequent, and Trump, of course, simply did not have the intellectual wherewithal to grasp that if he had the attention span to deal with it. I doubt that he had either whether the intellectual wherewithal or the, the uh, policy attention span to deal with this challenge. Whereas Biden not only grasps this intellectually, but also is developing a coherent policy to deal with this authoritarian model that people ranging from Xi Jinping to Viktor Orban in Hungary are promoting. He's suggesting that despite the messiness of liberal democracy and the occasional upheavals of capitalism and the shortcomings of capitalism, that a well-regulated market combined with democracy offers the best hope for the world, that that model is not to be discarded just yet just because it has gone through certain perturbations and, and has, uh, has seen certain shortcomings, it nevertheless represents the best hope for humanity. Second, as is evident to anyone living in India and studying international relations, as a corollary of that first principle, given the acute competition with China, a renewed focus on the Indo-Pacific. And that is demonstrated by the renewal of the Quad, quite apart from AUK-US. Uh, the two are not at odds, but are actually complementary, I would argue, despite the unhappiness of the French about the matter. Uh, and this focus on the Indo-Pacific was evident from the meetings, uh, the in-person meeting that took place last week at the White House with the four leaders of the Quad. That was not insignificant by any means. And one sees that the Quad emerging as a viable entity in the foreseeable future. Third, and perhaps this is the most difficult task that Biden confronts, and I have no illusions about it. And it, this is going to really test his intellectual mettle and his negotiating skills. Uh, because this is closely related to America's long-term future in the world and its ability to shape the global order. And this has to do with an expansive domestic rebuilding agenda, one that was colossally neglected, in fact, criminally neglected over the last four years under a president who cared little about the vast majority of America's population. And we saw an unprecedented growth in the United States of inequality and poverty. Uh, Biden, is addressing this in a laser-like fashion, despite deep divisions within his own party between progressives and conservatives, uh, and many of whom could well, the latter could well be in the Republican Party. Um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, conservative, uh, Repub uh, uh, the moderates or not, he needs every one of them owing to the razor thin majority in the Senate and a very small uh, majority in the House. So this rebuilding agenda is taking place at a time of unprecedented political polar polarization in the United States with the Republicans being utterly irresponsible and not offering the slightest olive branch to Biden and uh, this leader of the, uh, uh, the um, Senate minority leader, Mitch McConnell, is on record saying that he wants to undermine the Biden agenda in every possible way. Why am I talking at length about the domestic agenda? Because in considerable part, I'm a firm believer that unless the US can put its own house in order, its ability to sustain its global role in the years ahead, not tomorrow, 
not next week, not next month, not next year, but for the foreseeable future over the time, reasonable time horizon, that America's ability to sustain its global commitments and to build a world order reflecting its values and interests will be in jeopardy unless he can tackle the many domestic infirmities that currently confront the United States. Let me end on that note, and I'll be delighted to engage uh, my colleagues in a conversation. Uh, Professor, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was a sweet, sharp, and short uh, lecture. You covered uh, the Trump legacies. You looked into the uh, challenges that Biden uh, faced. And also, more importantly, I think you touched upon a very important aspect of the domestic, the internal divide that we would like to know more from you during the Q&A. We'll come back to you. Thank you, Professor, from all the